everybody, this is April Stutzman. We got another episode here for you of Glory Stories. I'm so excited to be interviewing this special guest today to talk about the glory of God, some of the first times they experienced the presence of God, how they cultivated the presence of God, and different stories that impacted their life, whether it was transformation and the glory, miracles that happened, and I want you to be a part of what this guest has to say, how they have experienced the heart of God in his presence so that you, my friend, can enjoy their story and see how you too can experience the glory and the presence of God in your everyday life. So I'd like to welcome my special guest that I'm interviewing. It takes a minute to upload. There we go. Let me expand you. Just give me a second. Hey, everybody. We're just fixing the screen and enlarging it. And then, all right. Let's see. Good to go, huh? Hey everybody, let's see if Adrian can hear me good. I can hear you well. All right, awesome. I'll introduce Adrian in just a second. I'm just gonna give you a few minutes to uh, share the broadcast before we get started because the Holy Spirit's here tonight and we're excited what um, Adrian's gonna be talking about and sharing tonight. I just see a few people logging in and sharing to share the broadcast. Hey Pam, hey Joanna. Thank you, Lord. Just thank you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Just give a few more minutes for people to share before we dive right into this interview. I'm so excited to have Adrian back on here. We just feel his, the glory really just building. So I just asked you if you're, if you're logging in, Lord, I just ask your presence to sweep over them, their home right now. We just find all distraction as we're setting this up. We just find all distraction. We just say that the the Lord is going to meet you right where you're at. Just be ready for an encounter as we start mm -hmm. diving into this interview for Jesus just to give you revelation. Come on, Holy Spirit. Yeah, come on. I'm so excited about mm -hmm. what, what God has been doing through Adrian and, and Adam both and what God has been doing through media. I see a few more people sharing and then we're going to dive in. Um, Adrian's been on here before. If you want to watch his current uh episode one that he was on here and shared his original glory story it's on episode 11 on the youtube channel and you can listen to his interview on podcast so i'm so excited to have him back on and and he just releases the spirit of understanding which i just i just love the holy spirit's mandate that he's put upon your life to stretch the the status quo and into the kingdom so I just want to introduce uh, Adrian Bill as, as people are logging in and his, his ministry is out of Australia and he is a multiple author, prophet. He, he just carries so much in the spirit realm and he's been to many nations. He's traveling and ministering and we're going to be talking about his new book tonight and it's Hidden in Plain Sight, Kingdom Mysteries. So thanks for coming back on, Adrian. It's my pleasure, April. <laughs> and uh, it's, it is really a pleasure to come back on. Um, I've got to be careful that I don't bog the whole conversation that we make <laughs> this way. And I've really, let me just say here that I really appreciate the fact that you have been putting up Deliverance Ministry, that you certainly support Adam and myself. And Adam's been on. Adam also has a new book called The Elijah Invitation. Yeah. And uh, that is an amazing book about what's coming in the next 20, 30 years and that we, we, the church, need to be geared for. So that is also something to be look forward to. That's available too on Amazon right now. Um, but we want to talk, you know, the passion of my heart, April, is for us, uh, God, we're, we're starting, the body's starting to see the power and the importance of the prophetic. Come on. And really the prophetic is Amen. the spearhead Come of on. any move of God. And, you know, we know from Amos that God doesn't do anything without first revealing it to his prophets. And so we the body of Christ need to be expectant for God to speak through the prophetic oh. The passion in my heart and the burden on my heart is that we understand what God is saying, because when God speaks, most of that, I would say so much of that is in parables. 
and we a little bit slow on the uptake of that. And we tend to think that parable was what Jesus taught in Matthew 13 and Matthew 18. And that's our little box we put parables into when, when we don't, when we fail to realize that it's much, much broader than that. Oh. And once we understand and we, you know, let me, I would define the spirit of understanding is this. If you're seeing something in front of you, what's understanding that what's behind that. Come on. So that's, the, and you need the spirit of understanding to see what's beyond the narrative or the, the scene that you're seeing, the vision you've got, the dream you've had, the, the scriptures you're reading and so on. And that's my passion is to unlock those things in the body of Christ to learn that language, because I believe it's the language of the kingdom of heaven. So for the, the viewers that are on here, I know you walk extremely high. And I, I, I think it was even last time the Lord was showing me you were just beginning to tap in it, that you had so much more of that mandate on your life. What would you say people that are just beginning to unlock understanding, how can they steward that? I believe that uh, there are there are the things that Adam and I have mentioned in the divinity code in God and God's prophetic symbolism. Now, God's prophetic symbolism so let me say that again. God's prophetic symbolism is a book that Adam and I uh, co-authored so that people could see in everyday life that God often speaks. And oh. so you would see something that you don't go looking for it, but it would find you. It would drop into your realm, your world, and you know there's something spiritual behind what you're seeing. You don't go looking for it, but it just twigs something within you and you go, that's really bizarre. I've never seen that before. And it just grabs you. And suddenly you realize that in that, what you're seeing in the natural, there's a spiritual truth behind that. And so for me, I think it's really important that we do understand that, that God's continually speaking to us. The, the body of Christ is waking up to dreams. And Adam and I are certainly not pioneers in that. There were John Paul Jackson, James Gull, a number of people have pioneered and, and gone ahead of us. And yet in another realm, I think we're the, like the second wave and we're pushing that further and taking that further for the body of Christ to awaken to the fact that God wants to speak to us in our dreams and visions. And the divinity code is an excellent resource for that. It's not exhaustive and it's really that we need to understand it, it's not a formula but it's primarily, it's uh, contextual and it's being led by the spirit of God. That passion and, and that exposure for me uh, into dreams and visions and understanding that and seeing it in everyday life, then also comes across and dovetails into that when you're reading the word of God. And so that when you're reading the word of God, you're, you're reading narratives, you're reading stories, you're reading history, you're reading about the feasts, you're reading about all those things that are encapsulated in the, the scriptures. And I, I would say primarily from Genesis through to the end of the Gospels where Jesus is crucified, those narratives all the way through that Old Testament, as you were, um, they contain beneath the surface of every one of those narratives truths that we as the body of Christ um, have access to and provision within that each one of those because each one of those stories is a parable. And each one of those, uh, one, one, once unlocked, you know, uh, reveal God's glory. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings. And we are kings. Uh, the Hebrew for kings is melech. Uh, it's made up of, or well, comes from basically from two Hebrew words, mala and leka. It means basically word, do. And if we were to paraphrase that and say, do what he says or do what she says. And so when we realize that we're kings and priests, but if we, we primarily recognize that we are kings, then we realize that when God does release revelation, he also releases a commensurate authority to exercise that uh, and release that, that he's showing us the revelation for. Amen. And that's why I just love and honor you guys so much because this just pioneering alongside of many other people about dreams. That's like one of my love languages with the Lord. I, you know, your dream life becomes so personable. And one of the ways God speaks to me every night, I dream every single night. So that's when I, I just knew um, that the divinity code is, is so if you haven't gotten the book, you have to get that book because it's so crucial. It's like 2020 vision. God can speak to you when you're awake and when you're asleep. <laughs> Doesn't get much better than that. Right. I, I just I just love that. And I love the fact that um, I think I can go here with you because you have the same heart as me for the prophetic. Uh, we'll just dive in here for a few minutes. Can you explain to people, 
I'm trying to get a clear understanding and language for the body of Christ. What is the difference of prophetic versus the prophet? Uh, I think Adam really defines that really well. And okay. sometimes the rock, I think that everybody is prophetic. Every believer Amen. is prophetic. Amen. Now, let me explain that. Um, well, you, let me just say this. We are all more prophetic than we realize. Um, how do I know that? When Jesus was asking his disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? And some said, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're the, you know, the prophet, all these different things. But then he turns and, he, and he, he focuses in on Peter and says, but who do you say that I am? And he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And when he says that, he gets the revelation from the father or he has already had that revelation. Perhaps that he's the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, flesh and blood doesn't reveal that to you, but my father in heaven. All right. And so that is a revelation or a rhema word from God. It's, it's that which man lives by more than bread alone. All right. The rhema of God, the manna. And uh, it, then later on in the scriptures, you see in the book of Luke, it says it's the father's good will to give us the kingdom. When we realize the importance of revelation and manner as the key to the kingdom, as the keys to the kingdom, yeah. then we realize that if the kingdom's there and we have a father and we're his children, he wants to release that revelation to everybody, Come which on. means that we are, must all be more prophetic than we realize because we can all receive revelation from God. And I think that's really the fulfillment of what Moses said. You know, when uh, I think Joshua it was who complained that somebody was prophesying in the camp and not near the tabernacle. And he said, look, oh, the, all of uh, Israel were prophets. I think we're in that day. But Amen. we're not prophets in the full sense of we're not all seer prophets. We're not all Nabi prophets as, you know, like we're not all Elijahs. But corporately we become that Elijah. All right. And so I believe that God wants to download revelation to us and is continually downloading to revelation to us. And dreams are keys of that, are, are a key part of that. Dreams, visions, opening scripture, you know, everyday incidents, God's word or the rhema can come to you in so many ways. I mean, I've only heard, heard the audible voice of God once. All right. Wow. But it changed my life. You know what I'm Amen. saying? And but and God can do whatever he, he wants to do with you uh, as an individual. But, uh, you know, that's my experience is primarily he releases revelation through uh, and often a dr primarily the dreams and visions. I know prophets, there's a prophet called uh, Brendan McCauley in Ireland. Wow. He, when we first wrote the Divinity Code, Adam and I, we sent him a copy and it, it, he took a while to get back to us. And I thought, well, is it too radical for you? And so I wrote to him and said, is it too radical for you? And he goes, it's not radical enough. He says, I don't do anything without a dream. I don't move without God speaking to me through a dream. Oh, oh wow. I mean, this guy's in tune. He'll challenge very, you, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he met with John Paul Jackson, and, and so wow. he had a camaraderie with JPJ. And so awesome guy, you know. And so uh, just the importance of dreams for us in the prophetic. I uh, love and then prophets, I think that Adam, this is really Adam's thunder, but Adam has a, uh, a message. Be on in here a, two weeks, just so you know. Oh, well, that's great. That's very, very good. All right. Now, Adam has a message and he distinguishes between the prophet and the prophetic. And maybe I don't want to steal his thunder then, if that's the case, if you've got him in two weeks. But the, the, the office of a prophet is more international. It's more burdensome, perhaps. And, you know, it's not always ear tickling. Let me say that much. Preach it. <laughs> Right. And so, so sometimes what you see is, and we declare as the prophetic, is really a, a generic word, and maybe yeah. not as pointed as it can, could be if you were prof, if you were a prophet. All right, let me leave it there. I think because Adam really has a great teaching on that. I love the fact that in James Gall's uh, prophet book, and even for the emerging prophets that are coming out, I have a lot of friends that are emerging as well, and they're all different. And I think that's one of the things. Like you take. I love how you and Adam minister. You minister with each other's strengths and you honor each other. And that, that allows the Holy Spirit to move in an unprecedented way, you know? You know, I think that sometimes we've boxed the prophetic. Um, we need to realize that there are, there are teacher prophets. There are musician prophets. There yeah. are dreams and visions prophets. There are signs and wonders prophets. There are seer prophets. There are Nabi prophets. Yeah. You know, you know you, you've got the, pre, the, uh, the musicians coming down. Uh, playing their instruments uh, when uh, Saul meets them, you know, the direct, after, under the directive of Samuel. And it says that they're, in English, it says they're prophesying as they're playing their musical instruments. Well, uh, yeah. in, the, uh, in the Hebrew, it says that they are speedy, speaking ecstatically. Uh, and I envisage them going, 
rumble. You know, they're, they're, there they are moving ecstatically. And then suddenly what God showed me is that they're actually moving into the words that come out of their mouth. Amen. The, the prophetic or the prophet speaks and he moves into it. It's a bit like golf. You, you, I'm not very good at golf, but my hand-eye coordination is not that brilliant, but at that sort of distance anyway. But you imagine that you hit a ball and balls can be words in uh, dreams and visions, symbolism. You hit a word or you speak a word and then you walk into that place where you've just played that word. And so the prophetic is like that. You're, you're speaking in, in the spirit and tongues is such a powerful tool for us to, to step into. And don't forget that tongues is a well, you know, it's a well within us. And so let me, can I step into this April yeah, with, with, with the life of Samson, which, which is touched on it in here. All right. Samson, most of us have this perspective or perception of Samson. Well, let me just say this. Samson is a character in scripture where the occurrence of 20 happens twice, 20, 20. Well, that should prick our ears to where we are right now. Amen. You know, twice at the end of Judges 15, it says, and Samson judged Israel for 20 years. And the end of Judges 16, it says that Samson judged Israel for 20 years. They're, they're basically his eulogy. So what you really need to realize is that he dies he judged Israel for 20 years. And in between the next time when it mentions he judged Israel for 20 years, it's showing you what took place after his death. And you go, oh, wow, okay. So what led up to that first uh, eulogy of him judging Israel 20 years was that if, if we cut to the chase, he is uh, he's taken by Judah, the tribe of Judah, the district of Judah, by Jerusalem, if you like, and he's bound and he's handed over to the Philistines. He, he asked them to promise their, him that they wouldn't kill him themselves and they bind him with cords. Now, what we need to understand is this, and that's, this is also deliverance minded as well, is that when we bind and loose, what does that mean? Samson gives us a good display of that. When we can compare the life of Jesus and the life of Samson, because there is a parallel there, not that Jesus was lustful like Samson, but if you see beneath the narrative, you'll see a truth there. When Samson's bound with ropes, it's the same picture of when they're trying to accuse Jesus falsely and he breaks out of those bonds. That's a picture of Jesus flexing that, you know, the fact that the, the, um, a lie or a false accusation cannot hold him. All right. Then what Samson does in Judges 15 is he's handed over. He's in Lehi, a high place, Ramoth Lehi. It basically means the hill. All right. It's likely to be a, a parallel of uh, Golgotha. All right. And in that place, he kills a thousand Philistines. Now, when you're under, when you're reading scripture, it's really important that when you're reading a, a passage of scripture, that you also resource and get another passage of scripture so that you can put two lens together and get a depth of field that you can't see when you're just reading the narrative. And so when you realize that from Isaiah 60, verse 22, that a little one is a nation, a small one is a thousand, a thousand is as a nation. When Samson kills a thousand Philistines, he's actually killing the nation figuratively of Philistines. And he does that with the jawbone of an ass or a donkey. Old King James says ass, but donkey perhaps is perhaps more palatable. All right. And so he does that with the jawbone of a donkey. Now, what does the jawbone speak about? If we're talking about prophetically, spiritually, it's talking about the mouth. And, and we also know that Jesus said it's not what you put in your mouth, but what comes out of your mouth that makes a person the important part. So it really talks about words. And a, and a donkey is either stubborn, depending on context, or it's a servant. Mm -hmm. All right. And so what it means is that Samson, whose name Samson means son, S-U-N. His name comes from a, a, a derivative of Shemesh, which means the shining sun. And if we know that, I, we, if we know that Jesus is called the S-U-N of righteousness in Malachi 4 verse 2, then we realize that Samson's life in another layer, on another level, is a prefiguring of Christ and what Christ achieved for us at the cross. And so when Samson takes that jawbone, the word of a servant or the servant word killed the nation of Philistines in a moment of time. All right. That's a picture of Jesus defeating the enemy at the cross and defeating the, the and he's making a triumphant, he's making a display, triumphant display of uh, open show of the enemy there openly. He's, he's defeated them openly. Then what happens is this, he throws that jawbone, and because I'm Australian, it's like a boomerang. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, 
and it comes back. And where it strikes the ground, he, he's actually at Ramath Lehi, which means the hill, and then he calls it En Hakor, which means the spring or the well of the caller. So what, in the midst of him being attacked by the Philistines, he cries out, I thirst, which is reminiscent of John chapter 19, Jesus crying on the cross, I thirst. And he gets revived. So he goes through resurrection there because the, God revives him. And how God revives him is that when he throws that jawbone, it opens a well and he calls that En Hakor, the well of the caller. Well, what this means to us, April, is this that we no longer are waiting for heaven to be open because when Jesus died upon the cross, he defeated the enemy and in the process, he opened heaven's well. So that when Jesus cried, I thirst on the cross, he wasn't crying, I thirst because of his physical cry. He was thirsting that heaven would be released on earth. And how is ever heaven released on earth? It's through the well of the caller. It's through us as a wee bubble. And the Holy Spirit births out of your well all right, these are the four wells that, that uh, Isaac went to and that Abraham had previously gone to in Genesis 26, uh, Esek, Sitna, Rehoboth, and Beersheba. And so we need to realize that we are that well and God's bringing heaven to earth through us as we pray in the spirit. And so it's so important that we do that. And I think as a, prof a prophet, more so than we need that, we need that refreshing that comes as we speak in the spirit. And um, I, I learned and um, I've been impacted by Adam's testimony of speaking in the spirit. Truly, he's, he, it's, I mean, our, our, our um, partnership has changed both of our lives, you know, with my, with my revelatory teaching and he with his seer gifting and his speaking in tongues has really impacted upon me. So, so what happens then? Let me just take Samson one step further. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. All right. So if I go one step further in Judges chapter 6. So then it says that Samson judged Israel for 20 years. There's an interesting thing. At the beginning of Samson's life, and I think it's in Judges chapter 13, around about verse 4 and 5, it says when God's uh, releasing, when the angel speaks to uh, Manoah's wife, who's going to bear Samson, give birth to Samson, he says to her, your son will begin to release Israel or begin to, all right, and that reminds me, as soon as I read that, that reminds me of Acts chapter 1, where it says of Jesus that he would begin all that Jesus, be, this is Luke writing to uh, Acts, you know, it says Luke chapter, Luke volume 2, if you, as it were, in Acts, it says all that Jesus would began to do and teach. And so Samson parallels Jesus more than we would want to recognize, but not only did he kill and defeat the enemy there at the, the Lehi, at Ramath, uh, in Hakor, Lamath, Ramath Lehi, but what happens next in Samson's life, in Gen uh, Judges chapter 16, is that Samson then goes and visits a harlot or a prostitute in Gaza. Gaza means stronghold. Right. And the, for us, we, we get thrown by the open story. And that's so true, isn't it? Sometimes when we're interpreting a dream, we get so emotionally involved with the dream oh. that we have to realize what God's saying through that beneath the surface. But when, when Samson goes to Gaza, which means stronghold, it, the Bible records that, he's, that the Holy Spirit deliberately records this in two verses. He says, Samson was there all night, all night and at midnight. Night, 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 midnight. All right, so three nights, and he comes out of Gaza and he has on his back or on his shoulders the gates of Gaza, the stronghold. And not only has he got the gates, but he's got the the the, the posts, the go, the gate posts, and the locking bar. And so, and then he takes that back to a place called Hebron. Hebron means union or association. Physically, that's 35 miles away. So physically, he had supernatural strength. But what it is is a picture of Jesus dismantling the gates of hell. And the Bible says the gates of hell should not prevail. Amen. And so now that, that authority has been carried back to the Father, but that authority has been given to the church. Come on. 
All right. And that, that means then that, that there's resurrection power available to us. And like Reinhard Bonnke, uh, we, we have an authority to plunder those that would be in hell and those that are locked in hell. And those souls, you know, those, those soul ties, all those issues that often come out in deliverance, we have authority now in Christ, in the cross, to actually to release those caught captive. You know, they're, they're soul captive, if you like, if they're still walking the planet here. All right. And so... Samson is an incredible uh, picture of that. I believe that Samson shows us Jesus' death, not only on above the earth, there when he's filling, killing the Philistines, but but also on the earth and under the earth. And you see that oh, he, ruled, he judged Israel for 20 years. Normally a king would reign for 40 years. And so it's almost like he only had half of his reign. Yeah. Uh, all right. And so we need to realize that, not only for Samson, but what Jesus achieved, even though he said it's finished, the redemption and the cost is, is, is paid. Now he's seated in heavenly places, and we now have the authority that Christ has, um, you know, we've inherited through Christ and through our relationship with him and through his death upon the cross. Now we then carry that on and provide the other half, as it were, of his reign. Now, I've got to be careful how I perhaps have stated that, but th if that makes sense. So Samson prefigures Christ. He defeats the enemy at Ramoth Lehi. Open the well of heaven within us. God, Rama, boo, boo, boo. All right. And so heaven's already open wide. And, and now he's plundered hell and the gates have been dismantled. The enemy has no power. I believe that the gateposts are sin and death and the law. He's dismantled the power of that to hold us. And now we stand in that authority. He's taken that authority. All authority has been given to him, all authority. And I believe it's above the earth, on the earth, and under the earth. And I think you'll see on the earth is what then takes place with Delilah. Delilah is a picture of Jerusalem, all right, because Delilah actually means delicate. And in, uh, in Jeremiah 6, I think it's in verse 2, uh, Jeremiah or God through Jeremiah calls Jerusalem a delicate woman. All right. And so when when he's dealing and moving through Jerusalem, Del Delilah, is, it's a picture of Christ's relationship with Jerusalem, Israel as its head. All right. But that's that's so I believe God's showing us on the earth, uh, sorry, above the earth, on the earth and under the earth, the victory that Jesus achieved for us. Come on. Powerfully. I, I encountered that so much in deliverance <laughs> and with anything, because, you know, Jesus Christ gave that authority. But you'd be surprised some of the things that we we've seen and, and talked about, but even as you were speaking and talking about the donkey, I, I just felt the Holy spirit saying prophetically, even three for the people that are under the sound of our voice, just keep striking the ground. I seen like with the donkey, what you said with this mouthpiece, you have to keep, because I know a lot of people have been here and this is the word of the mouth. You know, this is the year of the mouth to keep Hi, striking yes. the ground with your words, because mm -hmm. I just, it, like you said, the gates of hell are destroyed. And yes. Satan was a titan and picture of that. So it it's 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 for such a time as this, you know, it, whatever it's area, right. like you said, healing, uh, deliverance, signs, wonders, miracles, you know, whatever whatever the need is. And yeah, it, I think that's so true. That's so true. And I think what once uh, you get a picture of, of the worth of the layers beneath the scripture like that, particularly that picture there in the Old Testament, and the multitude of them, and, and I open up Samson. In hidden in plain sight, but other scenarios as well. Um, you then you have something through which you can you can model in your imagination to step into the the provision that that model or that imagination or that scene or that scenario provides for you. So if you can feed on that before you go to re resurrect somebody, before you go to minister deliverance, and you go to you know that Christ has that victory, and you know on the ground the spiritual ground on which you stand. Amen. And I think that's really important that you have that in your heart because your heart and your head have to be in the line. All Amen. Right? That, all right. And so you've got to believe it. You know, you've got to believe it in your heart as you're speaking the same words coming out of your mouth. All right? And that's to me, that's one man. And that's important. That really is important because a divided man with your heart and head, that's a double minded man. that can't move anything in faith. It's so true. And it's so funny that, that you bring that up because resurrection is real. You know, I, uh, I went to school to learn how to raise the dead. And, uh, you know, that's, I'm just real like you. I just say it like it is. And I told God, like, how am I ever going to have, a, you know, to step out in faith, like you said, be one minded, 
to to open your kingdom because he's given us authority over death. Mm -hmm. He's given us authority. And so I came back and uh, a person got hit on the side of the road and, and I ran over there, actually stopped my car. I got out. I ran. My kids were standing behind me and I, I prayed for this guy and I seen and my daughter was standing behind me. She's seen the breath of God flow into this guy. And he started breathing again. And and one of the mistakes I've made, because I'm in the process of growing with the Lord, was getting off the body before it was done. The rescue workers got me off the yeah. body. And I yeah. was telling God, I'm like, you know, because it forever changed my daughter. It, it just changed her perspective because you see the kingdom of God. You see the heavens open. And yes. so uh, even now, Lord, we just release resurrection power of every yes. spirit of death. Yes. Under the yes. sound of our voice, any any spirit of cancer, we just curse any prions right now in the name of Jesus. We just release your resurrection power. We just declare yes. you will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. But I kept like you, I kept having intimacy with the father. I'm like, God, what happened? I watched you breathe in him. I watched him move. I watched the resurrection power flow into him. And about a year later, you know, I never got an answer. And you know, when you, you're seeking the Lord, you don't give up, you know, you just keep. And I actually had a prophet come to me and say that when I had prayed for him, that the windows had opened in heaven and they had actually was able to accept Christ. And then I would see him in heaven one day. And I just bawled because <laughs> yeah. it may have not been the full resurrection, but it, it just, it makes you hungry for what we're allowed and to walk in because of Christ. Yes. I think it's so important that we do understand the provision that we can walk in. And that's, that was really the goal of writing a hidden in plain sight. Uh, because yeah, we're diving right in already, aren't we? So if you're enjoying this, you've got to get Adrian's new book, Kingdom Mysteries Hidden in Plain Sight. If you're liking what we're talking about, we're just diving into some of the truths he's got in his book. It's really a, a book of meat. Well, to, to me, uh, the, initially I called the book just plainly Hidden in Plain Sight, but there are secular books uh, called Hidden in Plain Sight. And so the publisher suggested I put Kingdom Mysteries. I uh, I'm not sure whether that carries the full, it does carry what it carries <laughs> in, in one sense, but in another, what it does is it's, it seems like it's exclusive or something, or they're just dealing, unlocking some things. The, the, the plan in writing Kingdom Mysteries in Plain Sight was to give the body of Christ all the, and the prophetic an understanding of where we stand so that the window that we look through at the kingdom has more panes in it or more glass in it so that we can see a broader view. And so in that, part of that, and we spoke a little bit beforehand uh, of uh, understanding eternal time yes. understand, and, all right, and understanding that parables are the language of the kingdom, understanding that the kingdom is here now, understanding how you, how you, how you gain access and all those things are explained in the part, first part of the book. And then the lateral part of the book opens up, uh, you know, David and Goliath, Samson, Gideon, all those passages of scriptures that we've heard multiple, um, you know, sermons and, and um, preach, uh, preachers from, uh, messages from, um, but, but primarily we've missed the parallel of Christ in those messages. And I think it's really, really important. The principle is that when you read the Old Testament, you have to read it in the light of the cross. That, that to me, if you heard nothing else today, that would be pivotal. And if you could understand that, and then, and then when you're reading the Old Testament, when you just get a hint of the cross, just ask the Holy Spirit to open the rest of it to you. Because when it suddenly does, when God opens that passage, a bit like the revelation that Peter received that uh, Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, when God releases the revelation, he also releases the authority for you to stand in that revelation. Can I just also mention this, that we just talked about having a head and a heart aligned. Jesus often speaks the loudest or God often speaks the loudest when he doesn't say anything at all. <laughs> and, and so sometimes that can be a little bit frustrating. But let me demonstrate that when we're talking about authority. The, the, the Sadducees or the, the, you know, the sect of the Sadducees, the priesthood, came to Jesus and said, where do you get this authority? You know, they were looking for it because they'd got it down the line in a sense, you know, uh, hierarchical and through their heritry, her, uh, heritry. Um, but Jesus goes, let me ask you a question. He says, the baptism of John, was it from, from man or was it from God? And they go, well, if we say it was from man, then the, the crowd will stone us because they believe it was from God. And if we say it was from uh, God, then he will say, why didn't you believe us? So we say, we don't know. 
Jesus answered their question where he got his authority without answering it. They answered their own question because in that indecision, that double-mindedness, they had no authority. And that's the key to authority is that we need to have our heart and our head aligned. And Gideon, the story of Gideon um, opens that up to us in a greater a measure, in a greater way. When the enemy comes and it attacks us and there's an issue in our life, he normally does so with fear. Come and on. what fear does is it divides our head and our heart. So even though we could be speaking one thing out of our mouth, if our heart doesn't believe it or if we're in fear, we will crumble as soon as we're attacked because there's no foundation. All right. And so that's so it's really important that we, first of all, receive revelation in our heart and then we align our mouth to that because then we know it wasn't us. It wasn't a good idea. It was a God idea or God revelation. And that's where we have the authority. It's so true. And, and even that's what I love about this book. Uh, I know we're going to dive into chapter seven in just a minute, but you can use it like a devotional. You know, when he, when I got this book, I just felt the weight of glory upon this thing. It, it's just that understanding locking. So if you want to take this and you want to just, he has applications in each chapter, which I love because it makes you pause, like he said, and apply the kingdom principle that he's under locking through revelation and understanding to you. And I know one of the things the Holy spirit, like you said, was bring it into, into eternity into today. So like you said, I love this question you asked in the book. It says, may I ask you the question, when did Jesus bear our sickness and take our infirmities? That is so important on receiving healing. Oh, and deliverance, uh, and deliverance you know, the, the yeah. word sozo or salvation, you know, you know, we just talked about head and heart. You know, we talk yep. about Romans 10, 9 and 10. As good evangelicals, we know Romans 10, 9 and 10. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we're saved. Well, the, the Greek word sozo, I think it's used, and I'm sorry about being this sort of geeky statistic guy, <laughs> but it's used 54 times in the New Testament. Only 20 of those times is it made in reference to eternal salvation. But other times it's used okay. to, for deliverance. It's used for healing. It's for overcoming physical death. All right. And so we need to realize that in our salvation is all of those things. Okay. And so in there we, if we come to realize the importance of our heart and head, you know, the words in you, in your mouth and in your heart, you know, is what Moses said in Deuteronomy. And so that's where Paul's taking that thought from. He's got the revelation of the importance of that. And so it really is important that we have our heart and the head aligned. I was going to say something else, but I just got distracted in my thinking there, April. If you ask me that question or you, we go over the same ground, I can cover that. Um, I was just saying, like, people that are standing for their healing or deliverance, um, if, they, if they need breakthrough, I would say Chapter 7, um, just the, the understanding that you unpack in there, I would highly recommend. And a lot of times, you know, we have to break off disappointment of – uh, just people getting prayed for, for healing and it not manifesting immediately just to break that off. And like you said, and in, in chapter seven is aligning your heart to receive. There's really an aligning in your heart to receive um, right now, like kingdom is now. And that's why I love that you unpack in this book, the mystery of the kingdom is now in every single chapter in a different way, which is very unique. It's, it's true. Each, each, each one builds on the previous. Yes. Um, I think what's important in that chapter, in chapter seven particularly, is our understanding of eternal time. Yes. But let me just say this. Most of us have been primed for Jesus' return, and that's correct. That Jesus is returning, and there will be a physical kingdom. I'm not denying that, but what I'm also saying is there's a kingdom here now. Come on. It, it was, when he was saying it's at hand, and I won't partake of this fruit of the vine until, you know, I'm in the kingdom. That kingdom's here right now. Uh, let me just, I want to talk about communion, but before I do, let me explain eternal time as best as I understand it, all right? I'm not saying that I'm the geophysicist, you know. But it, in that chapter 7 in Kingdom Mysteries Hidden in Plain Sight, I referred to Matthew chapter 8, which is the beginning of Jesus' ministry in uh, Matthew's gospel. I, that, that's in there. You can see where I've come from to, to get that because I just want to capture the chase. Yeah, Matthew he, he, 17, he, yeah, yep. All right. uh, so Matthew eight, and he heals um, the he heals um, uh, a leper, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then he tells him to go and give the offering for the you know the sacrifice or the offering for a leper, the cleansing of a leper. The offering for the the, the cleansing of a leper is to get two heavenly beings, two turtle doves, put one in an earthen vessel, kill that bird, dip the other bird in the blood so that when it flies, it actually spreads the message of that. That's Jesus who's been clothed in an earthen vessel 
and his death. And now the Holy Spirit shares that message. When Jesus was uh, cleansing that leper, he was actually signaling or telegraphing to the priesthood that that day had come, that he now, full of the Spirit of God, his death would now cause the, the, the healing of our sin and sin and leprosy have a parallel in Scripture. He then goes and heals the centurion's servant, and then he goes to Peter's house and he heals his mother-in-law of a fever. But it says that night they brought to him all those who were demon-possessed and sick. And he, with a word, he cast out the demons and then he healed all those of their sickness and disease. And then it says this amazing thing. It says, and he did that in, a, in accordance with what Elijah, sorry, what Isaiah had said and that he bore our sicknesses and diseases. So I asked the question there, and you mentioned it before, where did Jesus bear our sicknesses and diseases? Well, we would say at the cross. Well, technically, the scriptures say in Isaiah 53, um, by your stripes, by his stripes we healed. And so we would say technically from the whipping post to the cross, that passion is, is the window in which we've been healed. And so when Jesus heals in Matthew chapter 8, he does so, if we've got a timeline here, he does so in, at, before, in Matthew chapter 8, before he's actually got to Matthew 26, where he's going to be arrested and then, you know, and, and then crucified. So Matthew chapter 8, he's already moving in the provision of the cross before he has chronologically arrived there, which is the amazing thing, because he understands that the kingdom is eternal. And that's the thing that we need to understand. That's why it's both now and future. The kingdom Amen. is both now and future. And so what he does is he steps out of chronological time and he steps into eternal time, accesses a truth yet to happen chronologically, and he brings it back into chronological time and applies that. That's the provision that we have. You know, we we are the real Doctor Who's. We're the ones with the TARDIS. We, it's, a, it's this TARDIS here I'm talking about. We have provision to move into the eternal realm and travel in time, as it were, through the scriptures and through what our understanding and our imagination to access provision. And it's that provision that's pro there all the way through the Old Testament from Genesis 1-1 all the way through to Christ's death upon the cross. As we open up every one of those passages, there are, there are the, the promises of God. And so let me preface this. Just as Israel moved into the promised land, from Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land, we move from uh, the world to having our mind transformed Come on. Right, into the land of his promises. They moved into the promised land and we live in, moved into the land of his promises. All of his promises we know from Corinthians is our yes and amen in him. Yes and in him, amen. So in Christ, we have access to all those provisions. So if we read the scriptures in the light of the cross, we become in him and we draw from those truths and we apply that today. And there is a plethora of provision, and that's what I attempted to do in Hidden in Plain Sight. Now, Hidden in Plain Sight opens up multiple of those, those uh, places where there's provision, but every one of us once we understand the principles of this can open up passages and god can speak to us through everyday events through that or through the uh, dreams and visions to open up and at least release revelation or the rhema word to us which is the manner from the old testament so that we can step in and access what we've got in this kingdom that's why i love that's so unique about this book is because we are in a different kingdom and you have to keep that perspective because you know as, as a kingdom minded believer, as we think about well, no, what Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Like you said, all throughout this book, it will challenge you to have revelation, whether it's on communion, whether it's on, you know, um, Laban and the law. I love that one. There's so much stuff to unpack that the Abrahamic bloodline, how principles that are applied in the word can help us to access what we need kingdom right now, that everything is on the cross and it actually will challenge challenge people to step out if you're at the bus stop that the kingdom of god is right there what if somebody got hit by a car i mean let's just make it real like you know what are you going to do are you going to stand there or is the kingdom of god at hand yes you know, it, it, and and like you said the authority the gates of hell will not prevail against like with deliverance deliverance is a miracle it's part of the children's bread so it's part of the kingdom and the atonement mm -hmm. yes 
And I love, um, also it was a chapter 11, I think was one of my favorites. I was going to let you, uh, I know you probably have some of your favorites in here. We talked about Samson, um, but let me, let me flip over to chapter 11 because it was so powerful um, talking about the glory of God. And one of the reasons for glory stories um, is, to, is to realize the kingdom is now. You know, we're a daughter, we're a son, and, and I've been getting testimonies as, as people have rewatched the broadcast and heard your glory story and heard Adam's glory story that it's actually allowing them to learn how to cultivate the presence. And I love it. And it's on page 51 and it's called the presence. Chapter 11 is called the presence. Without your presence, I don't want to go. And that that's just our heart <laughs> as a mentor, our ministry, Kingdom Play Ministries that me and my husband run, it's without his presence. Like when, wherever we go to do kingdom work, we want the presence of God. Like Moses said, and you said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Just elaborate on uh, part of the presence in the kingdom. So the presence and the kingdom are the one and the same. So Amen. there is a universal presence of God, you know, wherever we go, God's there. And yet there is a tangible presence of god and that's what moses sought and that's what we as believers have access to Come on. and that's the thing that makes the difference it is does. the tangible presence of god father i pray that the tangible presence of god would invade all of those that are watching here now and you would feel the tangible presence of god witnessing with what we're sharing here today yes. it's the yes. tangible presence of god that we covet and you know, I don't know what it is. I think it's probably felt differently for every person. But for me, it's, I don't know, it's a tingling over my body that I, I sense. It's when you, you carve out time primarily and shut the door from the world because busyness and distraction are the thing that stop us from investing in that Come on. You know, and cultivating yeah. that. Uh, but when you shut the door, it's that enveloping that, that comes when he, he just goes, thank you for carving out this time with me. And his presence just comes. I think that you carry that into your day when we take Come the time on. to do that. Now, Place you know, when, in, in John chapter 6, the, the disciples are crossing uh, in the boat. Now, before John chapter 6, Jesus has fed 5,000. Five is the number of grace, and 1,000 we just saw in Isaiah 60 verse 22 is as a nation. And so 5,000 is grace and nation the nation of grace. Jesus fed the nation of grace. Come on. Who's the, who's the nation of grace? Well, the nation of grace is Israel. All right. And so Israel is the nation of grace. He fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, five being the number of grace. And so with the word of grace, the bread, the with the, without judgment, but with the word of life and mercy and grace, Jesus comes and feeds Israel. The two fish represent, represent the witness of revelation and the witness of the signs that followed the release of the bread. All right. And so he feeds them and then they take up so many baskets after he's fed the 5,000. So there he is and he's broken for Israel. All right. He then picks up 12 baskets. Now in Hebrew, the 11th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is a concave letter. It's the original form, the, the letter calf is a concave vessel. It's a cupped hand. A cupped hand or a concave vessel is a picture of the human heart because we are vessels and we are filled. And, and David writes that my cup overflows, uh, Psalm 23, and we, we are we're filled with the spirit and we renew it continually to be filled by the spirit of God. And so we're concave vessels. Now, there are 12 baskets because there are 12 disciples. And as Jesus was ministering, giving himself as a sacrifice to Israel with the word of mercy and grace and the revelation that flowed, he filled up the 12 disciples. Subsequently, that. then he goes up to a high mountain. They wanted to make him king. He goes to a high mountain to pray. That's a picture of his ascension. Now he's in heaven. He's interceding for us as our high priest. And then that he tells the disciples to go to the other side. The other side is to step into eternity, to step into the kingdom, make that your reality. They're trying to get there in their own effort, rowing. And then he sees them and he comes to them in their storm. But the moment he steps into the boat, they're there at their desired haven, the Bible says from the book of Psalms. They get to the other side the moment he steps into the boat. Why? Because wherever the king is, there's the kingdom. Come on. Wherever the king is, there's the kingdom. 
And so his presence is what we seek. And so as we seek and cultivate his presence, hey, we're moving it and we're living and we're, we're, we are um, uh, imbibing in that presence and in that kingdom. Amen. It all flows out of his presence. And so we, we, we've established his throne. As we seek his presence, we're actually establishing his throne in this temple. Come on. Amen. It's, it's wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful. Yeah. And so then we know that we're, the kingdom's there and he's there with us. Amen. Amen. I just feel such a healing anointing as you're tapping in that. I just see the Lord healing gallstones right now. Fantastic. If you get anything, Adrian, just release yes. it. We just command that the gallstones to dissolve right now in the name of Jesus. The kingdom Amen. of God is at hand, so just receive it. I Amen. see migraines. Migraines being healed right now. Thank you. Amen. I just, Amen. Whatever you need, like in the glory right now, just receive it. Adrian may call out some stuff. I may call out some stuff. Whatever you need right now, just receive it. I see new ligaments, new tissues being released from heaven. Because just like Adrian said, and, and if you're enjoying this teaching, we're just unpacking uh, kingdom ministries hidden in plain sight. It's all about his presence, about the kingdom even in media, we've had testimonies coming in of the glory just coming in through the media. So just uh, even deliverances. I just see suicide being broken off right now. We just command Thank that you. off you in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Lord. That spirit of death, spirit of suicide. Um, you know, what that does remind me of, April, is the, the mention, you know, we can see it in a narrative. You know, like, so if we look at the Old Testament, we can see it in a narrative. But we also need to realize that sometimes it's encapsulated in one verse. Come on. Zephaniah 3.17 is one of the examples that I open in, in that. And it says, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. All right. The ultimate salvation is at the cross. So the Lord thy God in the midst. The word midst uh, appears 222 times in, in the Old Testament. So if you've been seeing the, the number 222, could well be that God's trying to draw your attention. And that word midst when you open it up, it describes the offerings that were made, and it it, it, it means it, and describes the internal organs of the of the sacrifice. Um, the Lord thy God in the midst of you. So if you've got an issue in your organs, but it also can mean uh, in your mental capacity. So if there's depression in terms of suicide, then the Lord thy God in the midst. If there is an issue that, that with some sort of mental cognitive issue, Father, the Lord thy God in the midst of the is mighty he will save uh, and and it says that he will rejoice over you with joy when you pull that apart and i do pull that apart in hidden in plain sight there are uh, it says rejoice and then it says joy and joy each one of those levels of rejoicing and joy actually move in a transition one the first one is the joy of actually it's used in the old testament the joy of dying that's the death of Jesus on the cross. And then there's the joy of, of it finally moves to the place where there's the joy of, um, of splitting the spoils of war. Uh, you know, so it actually, yeah. it actually moves into progression from him being joyful and opening his arms to die for us and being for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And then suddenly he sees the joy and the joy that we partake of as we can partake of the spoils of war of that victory that he's won for us and so i would join with april now and we would just declare healing in every part of you the lord thy god in the midst zephaniah 317 the lord thy god in the midst of the is might in the, in the midst of you and so here he is at work in you this is the temple of the holy spirit he's enthroned we just talked about his presence You've got the revelation in your heart and now you in your mouth. You're bringing that same revelation out through your mouth. You're one, one man and you're speaking authority. According to the revelation that you've received here, you're, re you're receiving that healing. Amen. And, and you brought up such a, a, a amen. You brought such a, a, a subject I love that we are kings and priests. Just to expound on that a little bit because I really believe that that's the forefront of, of God moving into this generation, kingdom, priests and allowing us to be sons and daughters the manifested sons and daughters that carry the presence of god all right so um we spoke briefly about kings and the hebrew word melek with malaleka word come word go as it basically paraphrases as when he speaks do it or when she speaks do it 
And that's, a, that's displayed for us in Matthew chapter 8 when the centurion understands the hierarchy in the kingdom and he understands that if he says come, one comes, a servant comes, and if he says go, you know, a slave will go. You know, so he's got, office, he's got officers or servants that do those things. That's the same in the spirit realm, but for us, that's the angelic. Yes. Right? So the angelic is part and parcel of kingdom reign and kingdom understanding. Well, that's we have a whole uh, chapter of that in here. You got to get the book, but yeah, go ahead. All right. And, but, but what is important to understand is that priests, the Hebrew word is Kohen, K-O-H-E-N. Uh, the, the first and last letter is the cuff, which is a hand. And the last letter is the N or the noon. The K and the N is Ken. And Ken in Hebrew means yes. Oh, All right. So what I've done is extracted the H out of the middle of the H out of the middle of it. Ken means yes. And, and literally it's the hand and the noon represents life or activity. So it's the hand of life. Yes is the hand of life. If you were ex extended the hand, that means that the hand of life, it's a yes to you. So yes. Now, Cohen is the cuff and the noon with a H injected in it. Now, depending on where the Hebrew letter or the letter H uh, appears, the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, where it appears, if it appears on the end of a word, it actually means um, what comes from that. But in the middle or elsewhere, it means behold or revealed. And so you have a yes, which has been opened up, and now it's got in the middle of it, the heart of it is going behold or revealed. And so what a priest is, is a, a person who reveals the heart mm. of the yes. That's so good. All right. And so when we realize that in our relationship with him, we are kings and priests, we draw in our relationship from him. He is the yes. All right. Yahweh is the yes. And we then have the, 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 the priest who draws from that. And all we know, all of his promises are yes and amen in him. And so in him as priest, the Cohen, the hand of life, the heart of the revealing, the heart of the years, we reveal that. And then as the Melech, as the king, we have the authority to speak that. And so when we get revelation and he releases revelation to here as the heart of the years, and he releases it to our hearts. And when we start to confess that our heart and our mouth are lining up and then we're, then we're starting to speak in authority as kings. Amen. Amen. That, that, it is wonderful that we are called kings and priests and what a privilege it is. You know, and there's such depth in Jesus' death on the cross. Aww. One of the things I mentioned before, April, was that sometimes we get locked in our... Well, you know, Jesus gave us two sacraments. Mm -hmm. That is water baptism, death, burial, and resurrection. And that, that's, that's also the one of the things that I, I struggle with is the fact that we've made the gospel just death, burial, and resurrection and forgot his ascension. Come on. So but when we come to communion, so we have that identification through death, burial, and resurrection. But when we come to communion, not only are, are we partaking of his death, but we're taking of the partaking of the table of provision that's there before us. You know, uh, the life of Joseph in this book, I don't open this up necessarily, but I do open up Joseph in terms of him dealing with issues from the past, which I think is important in terms of deliverance. I think my experience with deliverance is forgiveness is a major part of seeing people released. All right. Yeah. And I think that, that I open that up in here, not for deliverance purposes, but for under, to understand that we need to release things so that we can move on and, and come into fruitfulness. But also uh, in either the Divinity Code and the Mystic Awakening, I open up the fact that when Joseph was in prison, this is Jacob's, uh, sorry, the, uh, Jacob's son, uh, Joseph, in prison, he interprets the dreams of a, uh, I'm going to choose my words carefully here, he interprets the brain, dreams of a bread maker who is broken and hung on a tree, and he interprets the dreams of a wine bearer who is in a pit and is resurrected. Bread and wine. Oh. All right. One's hung on a tree and taken the curse, and the other is resurrected out of the pit. And that's the, that's the journey that Joseph underwent in prison. The Bible says, uh, Genesis, um, I think it's 41, 1, it says, after two full years, Pharaoh had a dream. So in Genesis 40, he interprets the dreams of a, the, what we call a butler and the baker, but the bread maker and the, and the wine steward, you know, the, wine, the butler, the wine steward, so bread and wine. And in that, he has gets a revelation of death and resurrection, and he's releasing the past so they can be resurrected in Christ. And I think that's really vitally important. 
the, the bread and the wine. He's released. And as he's resurrected, he comes forth. And then he, he's the, the man that God can place. And he's a picture, of course, of Christ in that death and resurrection, because now Christ, though he's not sitting next to the Pharaoh, Pharaoh in that scene is a picture of the father and he's sitting at the right hand of the father. And now he distributes seed to the whole world as we hunger. And, you know, these past few weeks, we've seen people turn to Christ, particularly in Australia with our fires. Yeah. And there are, I see on Facebook and uh, through social media that there are so many stories of people, atheists, asking God for help. And so the very, you know, the very threat, you know, that we've seen in Australia, it's, it's been mammoth. It's catastrophic. Uh, in our own, I think there's something like two or three hundred houses destroyed in Kangaroo Island, which is just off our coast as part of South Australia. But New South Wales and Victoria, even more so. You know, they, so many lives have been lost. If you saw any video footage of that fire frontage, it's it absolutely incredible. There's nothing could, in the natural that could stop it. And, but we've seen rain come as people have been praying. And we've seen people turn, turning to God through, you know, like when we're, at our, our, when we're at our very end of ourselves, suddenly if there's only God. There's only God, and then suddenly from their heart, they're being, you know, from their gut, they're crying out to God for help. And then suddenly in his mercy, you know, he's revealed himself to him, them and his mercy and so on. And our prayers are all moving for rain. We still need rain in Australia, and the Thank fires are still, are, still a, are still a danger here. But really the whole world's been moved by that. And we've all been taken by the, the atrocities of seeing koalas because they're such a lovely creature and, and kangaroos, you know, like burnt you know tied up in a fence i mean it's such cruelty and such a horrible graphic picture uh well i'm so glad that god has moved people's hearts through it it's triumph and tragedy together it is and i, I put something on facebook just recently that um, it's the best of times but it's the worst of times and those two things seem to dovetail together here so far early in 2020 and maybe that 2020 represents that in some way you know, maybe that's what Samson shows. That's the worst of somebody, but also the best of somebody on another level. You know, you see that Jesus' victory above the earth, on the earth and under the earth and so on. So it's possible that that's part of what God's releasing to us in 2020 as well. Yeah, and if you're on here, I know a lot of my friends have been praying for your lane. So if you're on here, you know, be that that king and priest and continue to, to support that. the guys in Australia. I have so many friends out there and, and they've called and, and said it's 107 and, and keep praying. We're praying for the rain. Just keep just declaring your the rain to just Amen. flood in there and Amen. for a harvest. Like you Amen. said, for harvest of souls. Even now, Lord, we just continue to, to declare that there's a harvest of souls yes. coming out of yes. Australia right now that you just awaken them. Yes. In Jesus name. Yes. Adam had a, had a vision in 2017 of Australia on fire and he didn't think it was spiritual necessarily, but you know, first the natural and then the spiritual. I've seen other people bring that sort of word. And I think that uh, it, it is, it's a, it, we've never seen anything like this. And it, if we're looking at prophetically what it represents, but we're believing that the rest of Australia is certainly going to be a, a, a refocusing in, in Australia, much of the eucalypts and much of the the, um, the flora, much of the plant life regenerates through fire, because wow. it's part of it's part of part of Australia, and so it's destructive. And let, my wife and I drove, you know, uh, maybe five five days ago through the hills to get some cherries, but you'll see where there was a fire three years ago, and it's all regrown, all right, and there's regrowth through there. And so in Australia, the fire has the capacity to, to actually rebirth things. And perhaps that's Nehemiah. Perhaps God's rebuilding things, even with stones that have been burned. You know what I'm saying? That's so good. Yeah. I was going to the same place. And, and when Jesus got in the fire with Daniel, Shadrach, and yes. uh, Shaq, and they didn't even come out smelling like smoke. You know, that, Their bonds were broken from them. Come yes. on. It's so Amen. good. And, and you were talking about communion and I just have to go there because it's so powerful. I was listening to this teaching and, you know, like you said, I'm not the expert on it, but somebody was using the numbers. It's like 75% of our DNA is inactive. So when I take communion, like I, I really believe is a time of deliverance where God has taken whole bloodlines, the DNA restored to the manifest sons and daughters of God through the glory and so when you take that communion, you can ac access, like you said, the kingdom of God is at hand and your whole book is about unlocking the kingdom mysteries. And I love the, the piece on communion because as you study that, you can unlock the bread and the blood over your DNA. It's so powerful. 
I think it's true. You know, Jesus said to the blind men, do you believe that I can do this? So what we believe is Come what on. we receive. Come and on. so what, what we have in our hearts is ultimately what we believe. And then we can, we can confess all sorts of things unless it's there in our hearts. It's, we're not one man. And so therefore it's not real. But once you do believe that, you can grab a hold of that. And I think that communion gives us a point of contact. And I think that we as the body of Christ, a lot of churches don't have communion because they see it as a you know, repetitious rite. Yeah. It's a bit like saying the Lord's Prayer without any meaning or depth in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I don't mean that irreverently, but it's just a fact. that. And often what we do is there are three primary areas we go to. We go to the fact that, on the night that he died, he did this and gave thanks. You know, this is First Corinthians 11. And then it also says that we should examine our hearts. So we do that or we go to Isaiah 53. All right, by his stripes we're healed. And they're primarily the verses that we go to or the, or the focus or the themes that we take when we come to the communion in a church setting. But we need to realize that the cross is multidimensional. And that's one of the things that open up in Isaiah 53 verse 9, um, you know, when he died, he was uh, with the wicked and in his death with the rich. Uh, we have really got a wrong interpretation, a superficial interpretation of that. And even all the commentators have as well. When we realise what that actually says, uh, it opens to us another avenue. I think it's important to understand that when God says or Jesus says that the kingdom of God is in at hand, not only is it at hand in time, it's in, at hand dimensionally. And I think the kingdom's here right now. You know, his kingdom's not of this world. It's not a not. It doesn't say will be my kingdom. He says my kingdom's not of this world, and so it's here now, but it's multidimensional. And we need to be, understand, even though we can't see it, we enter it by faith and through revelation. And that is that's pivotal to us. It's critical to us to understand that dynamic. Uh, and so, in hidden in plain sight, my goal is for us to go past the cliches of using kingdom, kingdom this, kingdom kids, kingdom business, all that sort of things, when most of the time we don't understand what we're saying. Uh, And if we want to put some substance into what we understand as the kingdom, I believe it's there for us in Scripture. I believe also that God obviously releases revelation to us through dreams, visions, the audible voice, through the prophetic word and laying on the hands. But our primary source, and it seems to me that we're turning back more and more to this, is the word of God. It's got to be our foundation. That's and what so, I love about the whole book. You have a foundation, line upon line, foundationally unveiling the, like the dimensions of scripture. Well, to me, I think that's critical that we as a body are not naive and that we don't just like hanging on to fleshly words and tickling words and stuff like that, but we need to understand it's got a foundation. And once we get that, that we've, it's got a foundation, then we can stand on that foundation. Right, and so it is for us critically important that we un- and appreciate, understand, and appreciate that. And so, in th- in this book, in Hidden in Plain Sight, I uh, it's primarily founded on the Word, Amen. And so, opening up the stories is not just for opening up the stories for uh, for the sake of it. It's so that we can understand the landscape of the kingdom that we've come to, and how we can view that, and how we can use our imagination. It's important that our imaginations. For a long time, the imagination was taught that it was evil. You know, it's a wicked imagination. But initially in the garden, which we've returned to, we need to realize that God had given us a sanctified imagination and we can use that. You know, those things that we see in, the, in our imagination are real. And once we can put our heart and mind around some models of what he's given us from the Old Testament, that's from what we call, the, you know, the Torah all the way through the, to um, the Gospels. Um once we can see uh, the truth beneath the surface, we, we, you're given some keys in here to open that up. And it's not just then you're not just bound to this book, but then you've got a whole uh, ability to open up a whole vista or a bigger view of the kingdom and appreciation of what it was that Jesus did for us at the cross. What that does, it's done for me is made me fall more in love with him. You know, now I have, I have new purpose when I'm taking communion. I go, this isn't just a, you know, like a, a meaningless exercise. I, I, go, go, I might go today. I'm in, a, a, um, I'm in Zephaniah three seventeen, oh, or that. I'm in, the, in Proverbs thirteen twenty two, or I'm in there. I'm, I'm in the Akidar in Genesis twenty two. You know that you would give me um, the, the gates of my enemies. You know you've given me the authority to exercise 
everything. And so I, I recognize here that I can step into a dynamic that whatever the Holy Spirit wants to lead me into, that, I, that I'm in need for each time that I take communion it has personal um, um, meaning to me and, and uh, reference to me. Yeah. Amen. I, I know I, I have to ask you about this one. Chapter 18, David's mighty man. That's David is such a profound. Oh. There's so much revelation. Just just share anything about that chapter. I'm just giving them a little taste of, of what they will get to actually read as they get the book. But that's that's one of my favorite stories in the word, I think, because oh. he's such a worshiper. <laughs> David danced before the Lord. And that's 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 a it's profound. It's like the, the, the love of your heart. Like David just had that love for the Lord. Um, but yeah, share anything about that chapter that you feel led to share. Uh, it is a very, very powerful chapter. Very powerful. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a message that Hard to pick you know, one, isn't it? <laughs> I've, 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 I've shared this message, uh, you know, like, you know, you, you know, you, you look at each one of those guys and their characteristics and I've, I've shared a message on the surface until God showed me, Mm -hmm. that what it really was beneath the surface. I mean, those, we need to understand that those things physically took place. All yeah. right. So those champions were born out of those that David drew to himself. They were broke, busted and disgusted. Yep. You know, those are the guys. And out of that, the three mighty men are, are depicted as the, the, the head of those, those that were broke, busted and, busted and disgusted like us. But um, what, what I love about that is each one of them, uh, you know, there's, Shama, whose hand stuck to the sword. Uh, I've got to recall each each one of them. But what you see as you open that up, and, and what God showed me was uh, the, the battle takes place. David's thirsting for the water from the wells of Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem is the house of bread. Beth, the house, and the lechem, the bread. And so it's the house of bread. And Jesus said that he, in John 6 that he is the bread from heaven. So when David's thirsting, it's a picture of Jesus on the cross thirsting for heaven to be open to us and for heaven's provision to open to us. Mm. And what you see is this, that in the rec record of, between Chronicles and 2 Samuel, when you read the two mighty men accounts, you get this, this picture that dovetails together and, and comes together. And you see that the three mighty men are a picture of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're at a place called Ephes Damon or Pas Damon, which means the boundary of blood. The boundary of blood is the boundary of eternity. The enemy, the Philistines, are encamped on that boundary of blood. All right, and so what it means is the enemy is trying to stop us getting into eternity, giving access to the kingdom. Oh, and yet, through Jesus' death on the cross, what David, what David does is he, he cries for a drink from the wells of Bethlehem. All right, and so he's asking for heaven to be opened in another another level. And the three mighty men combine and they work together all right, and they bring back water to him, to David. David takes that water, water whether it's in a, a satchel, a vial, you know, some sort of pail or whatever it is that, you know, like maybe a, a water bag of some sort, and he pours it out as an offering. Mm -hmm. And he says, this is as the very blood of the men who went in jeopardy. Water to blood, water to blood is a sign of an offering. And wherever there's an offering, there's a judgment that's being made. And so we know they're at the boundary of blood. He's looking for heaven to be opened up. And now there's an offering taking place from water to, to blood. That's the offering that the same one that Moses makes in uh, God makes through Moses in Exodus chapter four. But then we go back. What you see there is this, that the, the first man who has killed, it, it records it a little bit different in each passage. One's 300 and one's 800. Those two things can combine because there's a double layer of meaning there. But it says of the other two, of the, of the next two mighty men, it says, and the Lord did a great work that day. And the Lord did a great work that day. And in the first one, it says one time he killed 800 men, one time. That one time in Hebrew, the word there, one is echod, or it's E-C-H-A-D. We'd say ekad, probably something like that, but it's echod. And in that one word, it, it's not just one singular it's compound unity. And so what it means is this, that in one moment of time at the cross, everything is there. And so it's almost like the cross is the, 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 the axis from, in the universe from which everything is displayed. And, and we know that in a sense because Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, that he is, his death 
was already in eternity, and that's what he accessed in, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, when he healed all those and cast out their demons. But what you see then is the three mighty men is a picture of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. all right, working together uh, in Christ as he dies on the cross. And what that does is then straight away impacts you and going, well, you know, even though there is a sense in which Jesus, the Father, turned his back on Christ, you know, because he came sin for us, there is a sense in which the Father's there as well and the Spirit of God are all there together working for our salvation. That's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know, and in a way that just the weight of that hits you and you suddenly go, oh, my goodness. You know, God, all of, all of God was in this. Yeah. How can I not? How can I not give him my spirit, soul, and body Come if on. he's done all that in the same measure in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in his death? You know, and you suddenly get engulfed in that and suddenly the enormity of what Christ does. And, and so as Jesus or as David pours out that water, it's once again, it's the offering, but it's also he's drawing from heaven and heaven's being open for us there in the mighty men. That's what I see. And I've opened up here in this book. So it is a wonderful picture, wonderful, wonderful picture of the power of what took place at the cross. There are multiple dimensions in the cross. Um, and so I, I believe that the gospel writers, the disciples, the apostles couldn't capture all that was there that took oh, place yeah. in that moment physically on earth. They, they couldn't see into the spirit realm and see what was done. But what is shown to us on spiritual, in spiritual dimensions is portrayed for us throughout the scriptures from cover to cover. And, and one of the things that I open up uh, April um, is uh, Genesis chapter 1. Uh, you know, where it says, uh, God said, let there be light. And then he separates the waters above from the waters below. And then he, he causes the the earth, the waters from below, he causes the earth and the trees to come forth. And then in, on the day four, he sets up the sun, the moon and the stars to have rule and dominion. I open that up. And, and so from the very beginning of the book, you see, God said, let there be light. And Jesus is the light of the world. Yeah. Uh, in the second picture, he separates the waters. Whenever there's a separator, separation of waters in scripture, it's a picture of walking through death or access through death. And so when Elijah and Elisha step through Jordan, which actually means death or descender, they're actually passing through death as the waters part. And also when Moses in Exodus chapter 14 passes through the Red Sea, Israel is now, that's their baptism. They're actually passing through the death of Exodus 12, the death of the lamb for the household. All right. As it symbolizes the separation or death. So day one, Jesus comes. Day two is a picture of his death. Day three, when the earth comes out of the water, we know from 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And so when you see earth come out of water, now we baptize by full immersion. I'm going far, I'm speaking quick, I'm sorry. But we baptize by full immersion because underwater symbolizes death. Underwater is death. All right, so when Jonah is thrown overboard, he's passing into death and Sheol and the graves. And Jonah chapter 2 is a picture of Jesus' journey into hell as well. And that also comes into the importance of the presence of God. But let's go back to uh, Genesis chapter 1 and the day 3. When the earth's coming out, that's Jesus' resurrection. And then the tree life comes out. It says, it, uh, it says, um, it says grass, herb, and trees come forth according to the seed within them. And so what that is, is a picture of mankind after the resurrection that we grow in accordance with the word that comes out of our mouth. Oh, but day four is the part that I love. And day four is this where it says that God set the sun to have rule and dominion over the day and the moon to have rule and dominion over the night and the stars also for signs and for seasons. Well, when we realize that when Jesus ascended, he let captivity captive and gave gifts to men. It's a picture of his ascension. In day four, when you see God put the sun into the, the day sky, that's a picture of Jesus' ascension, who is now seated in heavenly places, mm -hmm. and his glory now radiates to our earth, all right? But now the sun uh, and the stars, what do they depict? Well, we know from when Joseph had a dream, and I'm going back now to Genesis 37, when Joseph has a dream in Genesis 37, the, Jacob is in father interprets that and he says, you know, when the sun, the moon, the 11 stars bow down to him, he says, shall I, your mother and your brothers all bow down to you, you little upstart? No, you know, and he, he you know, he, he tells him off and, and because Joseph's got pride in his heart because God's given him the revelation. But he recognizes that the sun is the father, the moon 
is the bride or his wife, his mother. And so when you have the sun in the sky, who is the sun's bride? If you know that the sun from Malachi 4 verse 2 is Jesus, who is the moon? Well, the moon is the bride of the sun. And so the moon represents the church. And our role corporately as the church is to gaze into the glory of the sun and reflect that glory into a darkened world. Amen. Amen. And then it says, and you also set the stars also. So we know from Abraham, when God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 15, that his offspring would be as the stars of heaven. And so the stars represent us as believers. And we know from Galatians that we've been engrafted in because of our belief. And so now we're sons of Abraham. That's also in the book. And we realize then that as we as individuals gaze into his glory, we reflect that into a dark and world. We reflect it corporately as the moon, but we also reflect it corporately as individual stars, each one with a different mission and maybe a different time or season. And so when it says we're there for, for signs and seasons, the word signs actually means miracles and seasons literally is such a time as this. That's, that's just the fourth verse 14 without it being a cliche. You and I and everybody who's watching this was born at a particular time. And I don't want it to be a cliche, but we, we are born so that we would reflect that glory into a darkened world. And so you see the gospel portrayed for us there in Genesis chapter one. But what is what I don't open here and what is also incredible is the fact that Jesus, God said that there be light. Then Jesus dies. Then he's resurrected. And then he's placed into heavenly places. What about day five, six and seven? Mm -hmm. What we're seeing in the creation week is the first part of it is just the gospel. Jesus came. He died. He rose. And now he's ascended. And then day five and six and seven are the areas and dominion, the areas of dominion that he's given us. All right, over he says in day five, for example, that he's given Adam dominion over the that which comes out of the water, the birds and the fish. All right, and so when we realize, when we realize that the fish depicts life under the earth, that's why when jo Jonah is thrown into the sea, he's going under the earth, he's going into hell, he's going into death. And so, the fish and birds both have wings. We call fish's wings or fish wings not. Sorry, we call fish wings flippers and fins, but they're just in a different medium. Sometimes in a dream, you might be a dolphin, you might be a whale, or you might see those things compared to a life here on earth where we are breathing air and we're living on earth. If we had a dream where we're in water and it's not causing us problem, we're not drowning and it's just natural to us. What it means is we're in the spirit. Hmm. All right. All right. It could, there's lots of different things. The context can, it could be water spirits, all different things, but not to get too spooked about that. But a lot of the time it just means that we are in the spirit. And so a whale or a dolphin often is a prophetic voice, you know, you know, and those sort of things. And so there, it's important that we understand. And so when God gives Adam dominion over the fish, he's given us dominion over the spirits beneath the earth. And when he gives him oh. authority over the birds of the air, he's giving him um, uh, authority over the, the, uh, the, the spirits above the earth. And then on day six, when he, he creates land life and man, he's actually giving us dominion on the earth. So we, we've got above the earth, under the earth, and on the earth, just like Samson portrays for us in Christ. And so that opening that up is really, really important to us to understand and start to move in that dominion, realizing the role that we play in releasing and being irradiated by his glory and and reflecting that into a darkened world. Yes. It's, it's so true. And, you know, even if you're under the sound of our voice, I know this, this will hit the replay and, and podcast is opening up in different countries. So if you're listening and you're tuning in at a later date, you could still receive everything from Christ that you need under the glory that, that through the teaching, through the revelation, but specifically, I just want to give you an invitation right now as at, Adrian just unpacked what Jesus Christ did on the cross. If you never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior mm -hmm. and you're listening to this, just say, Lord, you know, I've been listening to this interview. I don't understand it all, but just come into your heart, come into my heart, make yourself real to me. Let me feel your presence. Let me know your glory and, and just ask because the word says you have not because you ask not. And I even feel like some of you are, are getting hungry as you're listening to Adrian and you're getting stirred up for the king, the different things of the kingdom. So just ask the father. 
you know, use me, ask him, you know, father, how, how, what's my gifts? What's my assignment? Like what Adrian was saying, everybody, you have teacher prophets, you have healing prophets. I'm more of like a, a signs and wonders. Like I got justice in the courts of heaven in my own personal life. That's shifting my bloodline. So when I was went, went to Africa, I was able to le release some justice on the part of the land where we were at. And I was able to release the justice on part of the land in California. And I really believe it's going to be a move of justice upon the earth. So usually what's happening in my life, I can release around me through the body of Christ. But there's so much DNA. But as, as you're getting hungry and you're, you're stirring up, um, what it, what are some key principles? I know uh, one thing I love about you and Adam is you demonstrate even as your meetings, you know, you're such an amazing author, but you demonstrate everywhere you go. And, and for people that are stirring up in the gifts, what would you say is your favorite glory story of maybe when you were traveling over the last Y'all been everywhere. <laughs> just pick your favorite location and just share and, and uh, just let them. I just feel the heart of God to activate people right now. So just even as Adrian shares it, we just activate healing. We activate deliverance. We activate dreams and visions under the sound Amen. of our voice. Amen. We just Amen. do our act of ocean over every discerning of spirits, every gift that the Holy Spirit, he has to impart it. So we just, and, and Adrian, if you want to release any of the, any of the spirit of understanding or what you carry, go for it. So if you're watching this right now and the spirits of wisdom and understanding, I believe that when, whenever God releases revelation to us, sort of encoded in that revelation is the wisdom to actually apply the revelation that you have been have received. Just as Joseph knew to build uh, some sort of containers or whatever it was to store, or uh, well, God then downloaded perhaps to him the, the means to store seed so it wouldn't be, you know, uh, wasted away or insects wouldn't destroy it and so on. I believe that God has given us a plan in the revelation that he releases to us. And sometimes we've just got to take the first step in understanding what he's saying to us so that we can then see him unfold the rest of the wisdom that we need. And that's true, I think, in deliverance too. You might get a key uh, to unlock something, but then you're waiting for God to give you the wisdom to know how to apply that or yes. where to take this, this journey on from. Um, and so I would release those who are watching right now, I, Father, I pray that you would release the spirits of wisdom and understanding to our viewers. Lord, that they would not just hear uh, like the seed that's cast in, in Matthew 13, but they would be people who receive that seed and would also, in a way, uh, produce fruit 160 and 30 fold. I believe it's important that we understand what God's saying so that we can produce fruit. Sometimes we speak of the 160, 30 fold without realizing we've got to understand. That's the basis of understanding what Jesus is speaking about in parables so that we can be those producers of fruit, depending on how much of his heart, of our heart we've given to him. Okay. Um, I get distracted in my thinking so much here, April. I'm sorry, but there's so much I just want to unpack. It, it, for me, uh, God is so good and given us so much, and so the kingdom is so rich. We just we perhaps have been blindsided to it in our religious understanding, and every one of us has a measure of that. And you don't know how religious you are until you're confronted with it. I've sat under ministries, and that's <laughs> made me, it made me feel uncomfortable, and then I realized, oh, that's part of that religious thing that's been ground into me, and I've heard it over and over again. And people have commented. Speaking of salvation, uh, I um, uh, I spoke to a shopkeeper. I, I gifted her with a copy of Hidden in Plain Sight, and she's she said that her friend, she'd been reading the book to her friend, her friend started to repent when he realized the goodness of God from reading the book. That's so right. good. And so she was over the moon, all right? She was over the top with uh, bursting with enthusiasm for the, the power of the revelation that's been released. And, and so, I, you know, give praise to God, amen, amen for all of that. Um, uh, but primarily I wrote it for believers and, but, and so that we would start to understand what Christ has released to us. And so we really would understand the kingdom. It's no longer, I don't want it to be any longer a cliche, but that we move in it. We understand the power of the prophetic. We understand the voice of God through the prophetic and through the, the parabolic nature of what he says and that we start to activate that kingdom because 2020 is really that, that era and that pay, you know, 577, seven, uh, or is it 5779, 57780 is, is the year in which we step into the voice, of the, 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 the decade of the mouth. And I believe that God wants to bring revelation to our heart 
that we can release into our mouths and move in that authority. Uh, so, such a key on. for the revelation and the activations that you release in here. One of the things I love about the spirit of understanding and all throughout this book, if you're, if you're just logging in and uh, I know we'll just go a little bit longer, but if you haven't bought kingdom mysteries hidden in plain sight, we're just discussing some of that revelation and where I know they can get it on Amazon. Is there some other places um, they can get your book? Well, yeah, it's it's in Books a Million. It is in uh, Barnes and Noble. In it depends on what state you're in and what city or town you're in. I, I noticed that it is in a number of places like that. It's on uh, Amazon U, uh, UK, Amazon Australia. Uh, there are book, good bookstores have it. Uh, I know that in Australia, Kurong have sold out, but they are accept, they're expecting another shipment uh, mid January. All right, and so. Uh, waiting for that to come um but um if you want it earlier i would perhaps order it through amazon or amazon au you know dot com dot au so that we could uh you know you can grab a hold of it um it i think it's sometimes carving out time to read a book is uh, in our busy lifestyles a little bit of a hard thing to do and that's why i've written it with 40 chapters of you know digestible but nicely sized revelation so that the person can actually t tackle it as a devotional. And so yeah. therefore that's nice. And so that you don't have to sit down and read it. And some people have read it. Or, or, or have been reading it and said, like, I can't put it for the thing down. That's great. If you've got that time out to do that, but if you haven't, then reading it as a devotional gives you that ability to actually imbibe it, process it, make the application each day. And it becomes part of you. And I think that's, I modeled that on Jesus when he was with the disciples for 40 days. Mm. Now, what did he teach them? How did he unload it? Why didn't they record it? I believe that they didn't record what he wrote. Uh, and, and it doesn't make any sense to me for him to lead them through 40 days if they weren't actually going to step into it. I see 40 as the number of gestation, uh, you know, just before a, mo a woman gives birth, 40 weeks of pregnancy. I believe that we are, are stepping through the wilderness, the 40 days in the wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness, 40 and then we're stepping into the kingdom we're stepping into kingdom sonship kingdom reign and so god sets that apart as 40 is the right time to reign and, you know just as david joseph um uh, uh, they, they're all th they're 30 when they come there but the kings like saul david and and so on solomon were all 40 years reigning when they came to the throne and i think the 40 is the complete reign all right. And so that 40 not only is a gestation period, but it also causes us to step into that kingship and, and priesthood that you've been talking about. Yeah. It, it's amen. so powerful. It, amen. And even like I, what I love about the spirit of understanding and somebody just posted the Amazon link so you can actually just click on that. But what I love about it is it's, it's, it takes, uh, like you said, the word and, and the gift that, and the mandate that God has given you as to make a type and shadow. Is, is another language I like to use that, that you take the Old Testament scriptures and you apply it, like you said, to the cross, which which is a powerful tool of the Holy Spirit, because then it's a new level of intimacy that you, you can receive with the father as you unlock chapter by chapter and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal through Adrian, and actually, you know, impartations come in books. A lot of people don't understand that. <laughs> so even as you study and you impart and he imparts his knowledge and his, his gift and you're, you're sowing money into that. And if you feel led to sow a seed to Adrian today, um, what are the next meetings that you guys have coming up, Adrian? Uh, Adam and I have a tour in Australia in February, March. And so we are in Bendigo, which is a town in Australia, one of the gold mining towns in Australia. A major gold rush, uh, 1849, wow. 1859, That's I can't so recall. Cool. But, yeah. uh, and then we have a meeting in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne, Australia. We have a meeting in uh, Brisbane, in Springvale, Brisbane, or the Gold Coast, close to the Gold Coast, midway between Brisbane and uh, the Gold Coast. We have a meeting in Tamworth, Australia, and then another yeah. meeting coming up in Cairns, Australia, up on the barrier, close to the Barrier Reef, which is uh, northern Queensland. Uh, and then in April, May, Adam and I both come back to the U.S. And we are, we, for this for the first time, we're going to go and do some meetings in Michigan. Oh, All right. Wow. So we're looking forward to that. A Gilead, a Gilead healing rooms or healing ministry. All right. So uh, out of Lansing, Michigan. So we're looking forward to that as the first time to Michigan. And we I know that we have many readers and followers there. So that's going to be an exciting thing. There are other places, uh, 
Um, we also are going to be in Sacramento with uh, Pastors Joel and Georgia in Sacramento, the Pappas at, um, um, man, I some of the church names I can't remember. I, think it's, <laughs> I, I don't want to get it wrong, so I won't, I won't venture out, all right, and, and my guesswork. But yes. there are, we're doing four, four major weekend meetings in the United States, and the, they're the two that stand out to me, all right? So we're going to have a great time. Um, and so we've got that. We, we actually come back to the United States April, May, and October, November. All right. And uh, we also will do Australia yeah. and possibly New Zealand. All right. Uh, oh, in uh, September, I believe it is, or maybe August, September. But I think it's primarily September before we come to the States again. And so we're, we're on the go all the time. You know, you know, from our ministry, if, you, if anybody who's sat under our ministry, we primarily use dream interpretation as the catalyst and the demonstration. So we teach so you dream need. interpretation with very, very short dreams. But then you, then you see what the Spirit, Holy Spirit does with those um, people who are being ministered to. And normally that just opens up to words of knowledge, a whole variety of different things that take place and the power of God breaks out. Uh, Adam is, is a, a very, very powerful seer prophet and is in demand all over the world. Uh, I'm privileged to work together with him as we do a dream interpretation. Um, uh, he has this uh, incredible signs and wonders gifting uh, uh, and many people who have been barren, married barren women have become, you know, uh, bearing, become pregnant uh, through a word of knowledge. Uh, and those that have the faith for to receive those things, you know, sometimes when you're in a meeting, uh, the word might be released to someone close to you in the, in the auditorium. But if the word applies to you, you need to realize that God doesn't give by measure. And so that you can tap into that word by faith. That's what happened uh, to um William Branham's wife, she was barren, and William Branham released an, an, uh, a word. An angel went over to the minister, I believe it's the lady in the balcony, and as, she, as the angel passed uh, William Branham's wife, uh, sorry, um, uh, James Watt's wife, one of the last remaining elders of the latter reign, wow. his wife drew on that release of that word, and she became pregnant that night and we've seen that before we've seen that in denver we've seen that in new mexico we've seen that in several places where god's uh, through through the word of knowledge released through adam and through dream interpretation we've seen that we've seen like deliverance like you i've, I've seen uh I, I saw a lady from Papua new guinea wow. uh, she released a dream that her daughters had she's got two beautiful children and uh, the, the the dream interpretation basically came down to there's the generational spirit over the family and because when God releases the, the dream revelation, it means you've got the authority to step into that. Mm -hmm. And so she fell to the floor, started squirming like a snake, but the family was delivered that day. Come from on. Through a dream interpretation through its interpretation. A dream being a mystery and its interpretation. Uh, it's, it's the same as tongues being a mystery and their interpretation. It's prophecy. And so the prophetic was in operation there. Dream, mystery. And, and likewise, because it's like tongues and interpretation, it needs to be judged or weighed. You don't take every word that someone says to you on board, but take those things that witness with you or that God witnesses oh. with maybe from the mouth of two or three witnesses or, 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 or sit your situation or you get that, yeah, that's me, that's my, bam, that's for me. Grab a hold of that. So what I basically was in the beginning to say in April was this, that sometimes God will release a word for somebody else, but realize that he doesn't give by measure. My cup overflows, realize that sometimes, you know, as, as Jesus was traveling to heal uh, Jairus' daughter, the woman with the issue of blood grabbed a hold of him and she drew from him as well. And so we can also draw from him a virtue from him and from the word that's being released. Jesus is the, the embodiment of, he is the living word. Everything that God's ever said is encompassed in that life of the life of Christ. And so just as he went to minister, so does the, the word the, the, the you know, the, this does also minister life. And as we grab a hold of this, uh, we, it's like we're touching the hem of his garment, the priesthood of his garment and so on. And so it's wonderful. We can draw from him and he's given us such provision. Come on. It, it's so good. So if you're on here and you want to sew as they travel around the world and you feel led, be, you know, I don't, I don't ever put pressure on anybody to give, but the Holy Spirit, I just truly believe a harvest is going to come out of Australia. So if you want to sow and support as they travel over Australia in the next few weeks in such a pivotal time in history, where, where can they um, give to Adrian? And I could post it up after the broadcast. 
You know, rather than sewing, I, I think that everyone's sort of asking for people to sew. I, I, w- I want to see the Adam ministry and my own ministry to impart to others. Uh, in Australia, they have a saying, do yourself a favour. Right, I would say, if you're interested in this ministry spoken to you, get Adam's new book, The Elijah Invitation, but also look at Hidden in Plain Sight, because both of them will leave you uh, these are not just incremental knowledge. They're not something that tickles your ears. They're not something that you'll put down and forget about. But this, these books, both this and the Elijah Invitation, Adam's new book, will change your life. And if you grab a hold and, and it's the right timing for you to release the kingdom and understand the kingdom in its fullness and what's happening in the future, then this book and Adam's new book, I, I would say rather than so, so to yourself, and in a way, we, we will get a royalty from that, all right? And so, um, but you then you're imparting, and you're actually, you've got a deposit, all right? And you, then you can perhaps pass it on, or you can buy another book for somebody else, or you can grab a hold of the truths that are in both of these books, all right? And, and they will really, really rock your world. Come on. I mean, amen. Uh, amen. Get one for your daughter, get one for your mother. And that's what I, I love. My mom's been watching glory stories and i'm watching her get revelation so so cool like when you guys come on and each one of you carry a different gifts between you and adam and adrian you know all you guys combine it's like the cluster of the anointing you know that the holy spirit is unlocking and even that author that that scribe anointing would you just pray over people that are supposed to write books i really just feel led to ask you that so you know let me just this is the 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 maybe the adage or the thing that I've built in terms of writing, and that is getting started is half Come finished. On. Getting started is half finished. If you get some momentum, the anointing will start to flow and you won't be able to put the pen down or you won't be able to get away from your laptop because God will start to flow. So get started. If you've, if you've got the burden to write, uh, it's, a lot of people say they want to write a book, but they'd never get started. It's not that hard. Just start writing. Understand that you will have to change it a million times <laughs> so <but> true <laughs> you will have to edit it more than you realize but really there is such a blessing in getting it down on paper because then it becomes part of you you own it and just like the kings in israel were called to write the law the torah it became part of them and what you write becomes part of you and so that when you minister and when you speak to people you don't necessarily always need the notes, although they, you might need some refreshing before you go to the platform or the podium or you share in home group or cell group or whatever it is. But if you've written, it becomes part of you and you draw from that. That becomes the bank or the well from which you draw to minister. All right? And they're the examples that God's or the, the, the stream or the passion that God's given you. That becomes your life story. I, I believe that I've been called forth and I don't, for this time, and I, I, that's to me is an overused cliche, but for one reason, and I believe it's for this. I think that dreams and visions are absolutely vital and important and the, the revelation that God's given us for that. But this, um, God gave me an aha moment and I realised that my purpose on life, uh, in on life, my life purpose was to release this revelation. Come that's on. how important this is to me. All right? And... Um, I believe that it, this would, if we grabbed a hold of this, we'd break out of the religious mindset that we had ingrained to us to realize what is available to us and what is available to access here right now if we would just grab a hold of some of those principles and start to see the provision that he's given us. And so I've been privileged to receive that revelation. Before I actually put that book together, I was getting this revelation and I didn't understand how it all fit together. You know, sometimes you get revelation, you go, well, I don't get that. You know, that sits out there, that sits out there, all these little satellites. And suddenly he just drew the whole lot together so they become a union. And I went, oh, man, am I dull? Am I dumb or what? And then suddenly I saw how it all fit, was to fit together for us. And for, it wasn't, you know, just God revealing this thing. And I, you do have to pass through some of that. The revelation that God gives you, I found that you have to pass through the journey that that revelation holds. Come on. You know, every one of us has a, a Joseph journey. Come on. Every one of us has you know, those, those, you know, Archidar moments, you know, where you've got to sacrifice that which your future and you love, you know, those sort of things. And they're there. And you don't realize when God's giving you the revelation that you're going to have to step through those things and walk through those things yourself. But it becomes part of who you are, all right? Oh uh, and, um, yeah. Um, I can understand I just, totally. It's like that breaker anointing hits you 
for, for you to actually step into the revelation as you're writing. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it is. You, 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 you step into it, heart, mind, soul, spirit. And I, I, we, we are called to give the whole lot. And, and when you, when you sow your life into the whole thing, suddenly it just comes together. Bam. You know, we, we, you know, I get distracted with I mean, everybody else does with different things, but then suddenly you realize, boom, it's all about this. Come it's on. It's all about this. So and uh, it becomes your life purpose. And I think it's wonderful that God's gifted every one of us, every, everyone who's watching this. You know, April, yours may be a deliverance ministry. Adams is a seer prophet moving in power and, and signs and wonders. But when we work together, like we're working together here right now, together there's a synergy and there's the mouth of two or three witnesses, you know, and we combine. Uh, one of the things I've seen with Adam and my ministries is that we're so diversely different, you know, like, <laughs> He's a night person. I'm a morning person. He likes sweet things. I like savory things. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, we're just so, you know, different, different. But when you realize that God's put us together for a purpose and you start to compliment one another rather than criticize one another and try to conform the other person so that they look like you, because everyone should have your ministry. And suddenly you realize that when we work together, there's a power in that synergy that we wouldn't have if we didn't, oh. you know, if we didn't uh, work together. You know, so I think perhaps those who are watching now that they have relationships, friends, and so on that may be diversely different to them, but you have some commonality. And obviously, uh, uh, the blood of Christ and our relationship with the Lord is is, is that primary thing that unites us. It's the thing that unites my wife and I. Um, and we are different, you know. But we, you know, in a way, we complement one another. And it's so important that we realise that maybe uh, we, Adam and I both believe that God's sending out people in twos because there's that witness, and that's that confirmation, and it's like the head and the heart. And it's like in here, in hidden in plain sight, where I put that the two spies that went into Jericho weren't actually two spies; they were two witnesses, and they witness um, Rahab's head and heart confirming with the bloodline coming out of her heart, the, the, the scarlet thread. And so forth. she got saved because she had a witness between her heart and her head. Uh, that, that, those two witnesses, those two spies were two witnesses. And so it, there's so much, there's just so much that God's given us. And, and it is here right now, it's in another dimension, and God wants us to step into the fullness of what he has for us because he's waiting for his enemy to be placed under his footstool. Amen. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. It's so powerful. I just want to thank you for being faithful and stewarding the process of writing this book. And if you haven't got your copy, uh, it's posted in the link. And I just want to honor your time. And I'm so thankful that you came on and, and unpacked a lot of meat and understanding so you can watch the, the rebroadcast later. But uh, just, just uh, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that I, I just feel such a, a heavy glory right now i just want to pause for a second lord I just, I just thank you for the sacrifices that that adam and adrian have made lord i just thank you for um new doors and new keys and new cities being unlocked i just see new cities i just want to bless what god is doing in your life and lord i just thank you for new keys for new cities and new gates that the lord even um I, I just see you like unlocking a younger generation and understanding so powerful. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. You're just drawing in people that will draw from the well that you put in him, even through his book and even in the meetings, Lord, I just see an unlocking of a younger generation drawing from the mandate that he's put on your life because you've been faithful and you've had the heart to steward them. So Lord, I just thank you for the people that you will pull into his life that he can disciple and that will carry and uh, like Elijah and Elijah just poured out for one another because that unity that he carries for the, and, and the desire that he sees the, for the younger generation to walk in that mandate. So I just bless Amen. what God is doing. Oh. Father, I pray that the, 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 those that are up and coming, Father, those like the Elishas, uh, following on from the Elijah, as it were, generation, or those who are of us who come under Christ and now he's, he's moving to us. And it was all that Jesus began to do and teach us. I pray that we would step up and we move from being called into being chosen, to being choice, to being those that step up to the mark, to be the Elisha, and so that we can minister in the power uh, to see uh, all that Jesus did through us 
and all access all that Jesus released to us through the cross and that we would start to see the enormity of the cross and the worth of the cross in new light and fall deeper and deeper in love with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for you, that you've been with us. I've sensed your presence this whole broadcast. And we thank you, Father, for the mandate that you placed upon each and every life that's watching this broadcast. Your mission may be different to mine, to April's, but we want to recognize that mission. And so, Father, I pray that you would release the revelation and the word to each and every person, Lord, as they're watching this, Lord, that they could be leadership, they could be servers, they could be helps, they could be deliverance ministries, they could be musicians, they can be, you called us in so many different ways and each one of us gives expression to Jesus Christ in us in so, compounding in so different ways. I pray that you release the body, that you release us. Father, and I pray for the, the mountains of media, Lord, and I pray for the mountains of education. Lord, the two that I see are pivotally important at this time. I pray that you'd raise up voices in the education and that you'd raise, raise up voices like this in media uh, onto a larger scale. That April and Richard's ministry, the prophetic ministry that they carry, Father, increase it, I pray. Lord, let that YouTube channel, let the podcasts, let all of it break forth from this place. Lord, and I pray, uh, I thank you for greater influence in media through uh, believers as they're watching this. And maybe you've got a, a passion to start a broadcast, but make sure that you've got some substance to bring. Don't just bring uh, words that have no substance. Bring because you've got a revelation and a calling from God. You know, it's not about having Facebook friends, Facebook likes. It's Aww. about doing what God has called you to do. And so, Father, I pray that those that you're calling to be a voice in this day, Lord, that you release them in Jesus' name. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I just, man, I just sense this so strongly. So, Lord, even as we log off the broadcast, oh. I just declare a mass deliverance over everybody under the sound of our voice. Lord, that even as they log out, I just feel the glory so heavy. I thank you, Lord, that oh. you're setting people free of rejection, abandonment, any Masonic right now. I just declare mass deliverance over the airways yes. in yes. Jesus' name. You bind up their wounds yes. right now to speak to the broken hearts. And even as we get off of here, go lay in the glory. Go lay in his presence. I just declare oh. that binding up even the fragments right now you're binding up the fragmented souls you're making them into their true identity we just declare we just declare the gates of hell will not prevail against your calling and your gifting in jesus name Hallelujah. i'm just letting the glory flow really it's just really oh. thick. just receive it's oh. just glory is just unlocking right now so if oh, you're crying Lord, release, or you feel release, the lord release, ministering release, to you release. just allow the holy spirit to minister to you just get off the broadcast go lay along with the lord just let him minister to your heart just let him unlock i just see dreams and visions coming to people under the sound of our voice whoa dreams and visions i see the lord breaking off night terrors Whatever you need, even if we didn't call it, I just seen mass exodus, a mass deliverance coming. I just declare it over your house in Jesus' name. I just declare it over your bloodline for the ones, the Lord. I just see the Lord ministering to bloodlines. So we just call forth the bloodline freedom under the glory. Boom. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, we break any generational curses. Yes, Lord. Sometimes... Those in authority have spoken over us, put us in a box, perhaps put us in a category in a hospital or in a doctor's waiting room or in a doctor's consultation room. Father, we just break off words that are not of you. Oh, you know, sometimes oh. they might have said them with authority, but they might have said them with good intentions to try to warn us. But also we could be wearing those words. Father, let us only wear the words that you've said over us rather than what somebody else wants to predict and wants to box us in with. Father, so we break generational curses according to Joshua chapter 3, where the priests stood in the, in the Jordan and they moved through and the, the, the waters of the Jordan rolled back to Adam. Father, I thank you that everything in our generations, all the way back to Adam, is being dealt with by Christ. And so we release generational uh, we release uh, from generational curses and uh, we release galatians 3 verse 13 that every uh, the, 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 that which hangs in a, tr a tree is cursed and jesus took our curse oh, because he's not in a tree for us but he was cursed that we might be blessed lord we thank you for fruitfulness in our lives and we break those curses and those things that we've accepted as generational over our lives in jesus name and lord we just declare the plundering of the enemy's camp 
of mm. all we ask you to restore the generational mm. blessings right mm. now the ge generational anointings the generational mm. gifts the anointings the mantles the glory the glory that, that's been held up in your bloodline lord we just declare the breakthrough of the plundering of the generational blessings right now lord, yes in the glory yes. in jesus name yes Ooh. there's so many things we could say um, I know. <laughs> so true oh god he's just so good isn't he <laughs> yeah. there's so much he accomplished amen amen all right. so jesus we thank you we yeah. give you thanks we give you thanks for all that you have done for us and who all that you are and all that you, who you are Lord, we thank you we're such a, a we're such a privileged people lord we thank you lord thank you for your spirit thank you that father you loved us so much lord thank you oh lord thank you Fill the for hunger. the night of the father thank you Fill the hunger oh oh jesus Fill the hunger. open eyes open hearts we pray in jesus name, jesus name. amen, amen. <laughs> Well, I want to make sure I, I honor your time and uh, the glory's still moving. So go lay on your bed, have your own glory story, <laughs> get along with the king, go, go read and, and, and buy the book and, and just uh, let the revelation and the mandate that Adrian has just unlocked for you. Just just get in the spirit realm and, and look behind the veil. <laughs> so, Thank you so much for Adrian being on here, and I'm sure uh, you'll be on here again, or maybe I'll see you in the States. <laughs> Let's believe for it. Right. Yeah. I'd love to yeah. keep up with you guys. So when we're next in uh, NC, let's, let's make it a date. Yeah, let's right. make it a date. I agree. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Great. Awesome. Uh, hey, bless you guys. Bless Goodbye. You. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Go get the glory. <laughs> Everybody, that is another glory story for you. So I would just like to challenge you on the different things that you heard my guest talk about on the glory today to just get alone with God and ask him to help you cultivate his presence in your everyday life and see what kind of glory story that God wants you to be a part of.